and we will begin uh, in a few seconds. Okay, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Martina Conte. Since the beginning of Biomat, uh, 70 years ago, we have tried to combine in the list of a speaker of each edition consolidated researchers together with young researchers who have a clear future projection. Two years ago, for example, David Poyato was a plenary speaker at Biomat and now is the one of the coordinators of this session. And today is Martina Contestar. Martina studied her degree at the University of Parma in Italy and did her thesis at the University of the Basque Country at the Basque Center for Applied Mathematics, BICAM, with a grant from the La Caixa Foundation, one of the most prestigious institutions in this field. It has been a privilege for me to be the Martina's co-advisor on her thesis, which uh, was defended last January, and I have been able to verify during this period her excellent research skills. Today, she is going to talk about uh, uh, cell dynamics in glioblastoma invasion and progression. Then, Martina, whenever you want, you can start. Thank you, Juan. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. And first of all, um, I really would like to, uh, to thank all the organizers for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity of presenting here um, my work uh, at this uh, really nice series of biomat seminars. And today I would like to show you um, a study concerning some, um, some of the cell dynamics involved in the process of glioblastoma invasion and progression. And I want to say that this work is a joint work in collaboration with Professor Juan Soler and with um, Dr. Sergio Casas Tinto from the Instituto Cajal in Madrid. We are actually the biologists that perform the biological experiments that we are going to uh, see throughout all this, uh, this seminar. So before uh, going deeply in the, in the analysis, let me give you just an overview of the outline I would like to, um, to follow for, this, uh, for these seminars. Uh, we will first see, uh, we will have a look at the biological background and the motivation behind our study, what are actually the motivation that inspire us to look in specific direction of this big, big uh, problem of glioblastoma invasion, uh, because I think it is important to always keep uh, uh, a, a clear view on the biology that there is behind the mathematical approach. And then we're gonna to move to the really, uh, to real model setup. And it is mainly constituted of these two main blocks. On one side, we have our biological experiment at the setting up. And on the other, we will see uh, the more theoretical framework and, it's, uh, and how we actually formulate the, ma the mathematical model. Uh, third section, uh, numerical results. So I'm gonna show you um, three different scenarios in which we actually use our model first to see if it was in agreement with the data and then to use it and to, to use its potential in order to make prediction uh, about the possible tumor behaviors in different, in different situations. And, and then we're gonna just apart um, see the conclusion and lead a summary of the work. I would like to point it out to you a um, couple of perspective. So some of the direction of factor, of factor development that we are starting looking at right now. So, uh, starting from the biological part, um, first of all, the problem we are trying to look at is the process of glioblastoma progression. The glioblastoma is a malignant brain tumor that arises from the glia cell of the central nervous system. Um, this cell in healthy situation provides nourishment and support to, to the neurons, but when a new pleasure arises, they start to become highly invasive and aggressive. And this glia cell in, uh, in the neoplasias acquires a strong uh, migrating phenotype that basically determine um, this infiltrative behavior that characterized this kind of brain tumor and, make, uh, and makes the identification of the real size and extension of the tumor in the brain quite difficult. Uh, therefore, both diagnosis and treatment uh, in this case are really complex. And just think that for um, glioblastomas, there is often a poor prognosis, and there is only a medium survival time between 15 and 16 months. 
Uh, glioblastoma are, um, the, um, belongs to the family of gliomas. There are, in general, this big family of brain tumors. And gliomas are divided in four different grades, depending on the degree of differentiation of the cell. And in particular, glioblastomas are the four grade gliomas, so the most uh, advanced and the most dangerous type of gliomas. Uh, concerning glioblastoma progression, we mainly look at the process of cell migration and invasion in the brain with specific focus on some mechanical and biochemical mechanisms that actually drive, drive the, um, the migration of the cell. Um, precisely, we look firstly and mainly at the role of the cell protrusion in the overall dynamics and how they are actually involved and mediate the binding between the cell and the brain fibers and the process of healthy tissue degradation. So let me just give you a couple of details more about these three main aspects we, we include in the modeling. Um, first, the cell protrusion. Cell protrusion are in general a highly dynamic extension of the plasma membrane that usually the cell extend in response to uh, an external input to the gradient of soluble, soluble, soluble molecules or other um, signals in the, in the extracellular environment. Um, there are different kinds of protrusion depending on the context, depending on the environmental condition or the type of cell, but all of them um, in general mediate um, the interaction between the cell and their microenvironment from, bo from both a mechanical and a chemical point of view. What is important for us is that, is that um, it has been proved that for the case of migrating and invading GB cell, uh, actually, there is a strong expression of the cell protrusion, especially at the uh, tumor front region, so at this interface region between healthy tissue and tumor mass. If we look, for instance, at this, um, at this image over here, here we have in green a um, glioblastoma mass, ma um, mass in a mouse model, and the red one are the blood vessel, and whatever is black, it's actually uh, healthy tissue, so the brain ECM. And we can see how at the border, uh, where there is this interface between the main tumor mass and the extracellular space, there is a strong expression of this protrusion, this uh, membrane extension that are infiltrating, strongly infiltrating inside the healthy tissue. Um, this protrusion in the case of uh, tumors are also called tumor microtubes. So as I told you, they mediate several intercellular communication processes. And among them, we mainly look at how cell protrusion mediate interaction between the cell and the brain fibers and interaction between the cell and the, uh, and the ECM. So I'm, the, say, dividing or differentiating between fibers and ECM because uh, from a more general point of view, brain tissue can be seen as made up of these two components. So on one side, we have the brain fibers. There are uh, mainly um, organizing the tracts of aligned fibers that the cells tend to follow and that basically um, influence the direction of cell migration. They represent kind of um, highway for the cell to move in the brain. And on the other side, we have the brain ECM. There is that part of the tissue uh, mainly made up of glycoprotein or collagens, soluble molecules, other type of cell that interacts with the, with the, the tumor cell in different ways, of course. Um, we in particular refer to that part of the brain tissue that usually cell um, degradates in order to make space in the, in, the, in the tissue to move as our brain ECM. So interaction between cell and fibers are mediated by the tumor microtubes through particular um, membrane receptors uh, that are called uh, integrins. So integrins are one family of membrane receptors that actually, that basically help the cell to bind to the, to the brain fibers and crawl along the fibers following their, their direction during the migration. On the other side, um, among the different interaction between uh, tumor cell and ECM, we consider the one mediated by specific enzyme they are called proteases or MMP. These proteases are produced by the cell and released in the environment in order to um, help the cell to degrade the, uh, the, the brain ECM and basically facilitate the tumor cell dissemination in the brain. Uh, so these are the three elements, the cell protrusion as the main focus and their, uh, their role in the mediation of the integrins and proteases um, and proteases activity. But why we actually uh, went for this uh, specific element, why we look at them. So 
The main motivation uh, comes from um, several studies, the, the majority of which was developed in the last, I would say, decades, that basically um, un try to understand the importance and the role of the cell protrusion in the case of glioblastoma progression. So it was found that there is a protein called EB1 plus ending protein There is um, there is responsible for the dynamics of the um, cytoskeleton, so for the cytoskeleton remodeling, and in particular, it promotes the elongation and the extension of these uh, tumor macrotubes. So um, in the case of, uh, of tumors, uh, EB1 um, has, been, uh, has been found to be, a bad, to, a, to be a factor of bad prognosis for glioblastoma, and the downregulation of EB1 actually can cause this, this so-called microtube catastrophe. Uh, so the, the inhibition of the possibility of cell to extend the protrusion and therefore the inhibition of migration and proliferation. Um, there are mm, kind, some drugs that can actually downregulate this EB1 protein. Uh, of course, um, there is still a lot of work to do in this direction in order to make this uh, this EB1 protein, a kind of target for the therapy because just downregulating it um, would also suppress all the other cellular communication processes. So there, is, there, there should be um, a balance between this inhibition, um, the, the, the inhibition of this protein. But for sure, this is an indicator that uh, looking, at the, looking at the role of cell protrusion is important because they are strongly involved in the process of tumor progression. And so, since we were so interested in the role of tumor microtubes, um, uh, there is a strong correlation between tumor microtubes dynamics and, as I told you, integrins and proteases. And also, these two elements uh, were the ones that we were able to control experimentally. So, on one side, uh, integrins are these receptors located on the protrusion. And with our collaborators, we were able to uh, understand uh, the or to, um, to see actually how the knockdown of the expression of the integrins or their functionality could, also, could actually reduce the lethality in our, um, in our animal model of the, uh, of the, of the animal. So uh, here you can see that if there is no knockdown of integrins, so in a normal situation of tumor development where the integrins are properly working, there, are, there is no percentage of survivals in the, in the, in the animal, when we in it, when we knocking down the expression of the integrins or their functionality, we could slightly um, reduce the lethality, so we get a certain percentage of survival, and some and uh, somehow the GB expansion was prevented. In a similar way, for similar reasons, proteases are also been um, are also been uh, studied in the last also um, decade or fifteen years as possible uh, targeted therapy. In particular, combination of proteases inhibitors with the classical uh, chemotherapy used in the case of glioblastoma, there is the chemotherapy with temozolamide, seems to actually uh, reduce the percentage of invasive cell in the entire tumor mass. So somehow stops the uh, process of cell migration. So the three elements are really good targets for the um, development and the study of possible therapy for this kind of tumors. And moreover, we were, also, we were able to um, experimentally control these two elements. And these, uh, these were let's say, the main motivation that uh, inspired us to move actually in this specific direction. But how actually we, uh, we build the model? So which is the model uh, set up? As I told you, we have these two main blocks, the experimental one based on a Drosophila model of glioblastoma and the mathematical one. The, main the common and main focus is the study of the dynamics of the tumor front, and in particular, how interaction between the tumor cell and these receptors, proteases and ECM, affect this, uh, the evolution of the front. We started from the experimental part that provide us the first evidence um, on the basis of which we actually formulate the, mac the macroscopic model. And then numerically simulating the model allow us to partially guide further experiment that actually give us the possibility of getting some new insights into, uh, into the dynamics of specific processes involved in the tumor front uh, evolution. But let's start with one block, the experimental one. Let's see actually the setting of our experiment. So first, um, which kind of model we use experimentally? 
we use a Drosophila model. Uh, Drosophila is a fry that actually shares a lot of com a lot of genes in common with the with the human, and in particular, a most the mo most conservative genes we found the one uh, connected to the development of glioblastomas. Uh, this really high percentage of um, similarity between the human and the and Drosophila genes make actually this animal really an attractive system in biology for the studying of gliomas. And moreover, Drosophila, with respect to other animal models, it's cheaper and it's faster. And with faster, I mean that from the complete development of the animal, the induction of the tumors and the overall progression, the time frame is much shorter with respect to other, to other kind of um, model. And in particular, I want to point out that the kind of um, GB, the kind of glioblastoma that was induced in the flies was based on the same genetic um, mutation that we found in human. Using the Drosophila model, we got data uh, in, the, in the terms of immunofluorescence images. These images allow us to understand the distribution of, um, protein, of proteases and integrins with specific marker in the different region of the tumor domain. So in general, an immunofluorescent images look in, looks for more or less like this one. So here in red, we have the, um, the, the marker that uh, indicates the tumor cell membrane. And instead, whatever is black here is healthy tissue in terms of both um, neurons, healthy neurons, and the, um, the brain ECM. Looking at these pictures, we mainly differentiate between the inner tumor region the outer tumor, and more important, the tumor front region. This region of interface between the inner, the main tumor mass, and the extracellular space, where we actually see the majority of accumulation of the marker for the membrane. And we see this accumulation because basically it is at the front where the majority of the tumor macrotubes are concentrated and are extended by the cell towards the, um, the, 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 the healthy tissue, the tissue, let's say. And um, since tumor macrotubes are nothing more than membrane extension, this, um, this, is, this, this is telling us why we see accumulation of the red marker, because this marker indicates the tumor cell membrane. So we actually identify our tumor front region looking at this uh, accumulation of the marker. The three main experimental settings we look at uh, are here um, represented. So firstly, we uh, constrain, so we visualize together distribution of the GB cell membrane, distribution of the, um, of the proteases. And on a second set of experiment, we uh, constrain again the, GB, the marker for the GB cell membrane together with a marker for a specific kinesis there is called FAK, focal additional kinesis, that actually relates to the um, level of integrins activity. And as a third set, we, stay, we, we visualize at the same time, apart from the GB cell membrane, FAK and MMP. Uh, in particular, in, this, in, in the different images we analyzed, we always uh, put our attention on this region, like the one indicated by the white arrow over here, where we see the accumulation of the marker for the membrane. And as I told, as I told you, this is telling us that these are the front region where we expect to see the accumulation of the tumor macrotubes at the majority of the, the tumor dynamics uh, localized. So these are, this is, these are the three main biological setting on the, for the experimental block, let's say. What about the mathematical block? So mathematically, we look at the five population model where we um, describe dynamics of GB cell together with proteases, ECM, and two subfamily of integrin receptors. So on one side, we consider the uh, active integrins that uh, represent that integrins already bonded to the fibers. And then the other, we consider the inactive integrins that instead are the, are the membrane receptors not bonded to the fibers. Here we can see a little, um, say, a pretty easy schematization of the main interaction we included in the modeling. So we have a positive um, effect or uh, an effect of a concentration of active adhesion site and proteases on the tumor. We see the um, degradation of the, of the ECM due to the proteolytic activity and the fact that the ECM is important and needed for the activation of the, uh, of the integrins. 
So uh, the model was formulated uh, initially in 1D. And uh, before um, showing you the real, the, the actual formulation of the model, we need to well define two elements, two preliminary elements that are, um, that are important for our, uh, for our, uh, um, for the formulation of our model. So on one side, we need a clear definition of what we mean for tumor microtubes region. And on the other, I will comment uh, on some, some, I will show you some details about the kind of diffusion phenomena we decided to, to look at. So first of all, the tumor microtubes region. So we formulate the model directly at the microscopic level, and therefore we need to, we need to define a way to localize the different mechanisms that we consider in the corresponding region of the tumor domain where they're actually happening. So first we define this region, LTM, that, that, that describe our tumor microtubes region, this interface between the, the main tumor mass and the extracellular environment that depend on these parameters, HP. And HP represent uh, the maximum length of a microtube that is always something between five or seven cell units. So it, it could be actually pretty long with respect to one, uh, one, 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 one unique cell. And together with the definition of this region, we also define a functional that want to describe the tumor activity in terms of protolytic activity and integrin activation. So from the images, actually, it was pretty clear that the tumor activity was not homogeneous in the entire tumor domain, but there were certain heterogeneity. And therefore, we use this functional Fn in order to take into account this heterogeneity of the tumor activity across the tumor domain in the, in the formulation of the model. So this is the, um, all about the definition of our tumor microtubes region. What about the diffusion phenomena? So in general, if we consider a diffusion equation in 1D, one thing, one can think about uh, giving different formulation for the diffusion operators. So one possibility is to simply describe uh, a linear diffusion operators. Um, and as, as we know, in this case, we will get this, the infinite speed of propagation of our solution and uh, the, the profile of the solution will show the classical infinite tail in the, in the classical infinite tail. Um, one second possibility to, to modify it is to actually consider a nonlinear diffusion operators where the flow velocity is given by the Darcy law. And in this case, we can recover the finite speed of propagation and we can also recover the well definition of the invasion front, especially we start with the initial condition with steep uh, profile. But here, the uh, velocity of the population um, is, con is described through the parameter C, but connected to other elements, like, for instance, the porosity, the viscosity, or the pressure. Uh, a third possibility is to define a kind of more, um, um, more particular version of a nonlinear diffusion operators. There is called flux saturated operators. Uh, in this case, we will keep the finite, um, the finite speed of propagation and the well definition of the front. But moreover, we can also, um, in this case, we can also directly control the value of the cell velocity by these parameters the n. Uh, instead, that respect to the previous case will allow us to um, to directly tune it and modify it uh, depending on the scenarios we we will we wanna we wanna describe. So. Our diffusion equation in 1D is going to be um, similar to this one. This is, also, this is also called relativistic heat equation. Uh, as I told you, it allows us a direct control on the end, and therefore we can also take advantage of some information we got from our collaborators about this velocity and how it, is, it can be actually modifying or, or it can vary depending on microenvironmental condition. And moreover, as the nonlinear diffusion operators, this kind of um, expression, this kind of definition of the diffusion will uh, ensure the um, emergence of steep and well-defined invasion front that are for, for us are fundamental in order to be able to well-define our tumor microtubes region. So just to give you an idea about the difference between the evolution of the classical heat equation and the case of the relativistic one. So here in green, we have the uh, classical heat equation and in red, um, our relativistic heat equation. Um, if we let the model evolve over time, it's, it's already pretty clear in, in, let's say, at the first instant, but uh, letting it evolve, what we can observe is that 
the steepness and the jump discontinuity here is actually maintained over time, while in the case of classicality question, we, uh, we basically get instantaneously uh, a contamination by the, of the entire domain by the cell. So in our case, our tumor cell, and if we did with the relativistic heat equation, we can actually see, say, what is inner tumor and what is going to be outer environment, healthy tissue where still the, the, the cell are not arrived yet. Using a linear, linear, heat equa li a linear diffusion, um, we, can, we, we would lose this, um, this, uh, this, this aspect. So uh, you can see this well, with this pretty steep front is maintained. Um, I would like to comment on other two aspects concerning these operators, in particular concerning the velocity. As I told you, Vn is a parameter related to the population velocity. When m is equal to 1, Vn represents exactly the velocity of the propagation front, uh, so the speed of propagation of this front, while for m greater than 1, Vn will represent an upper bound for this propagation speed. So here, for instance, we fix uh, the parameters nu, uh, I didn't say anything about nu yet. Nu is simply the viscosity of the cell moving in the medium. So here we fix nu and we uh, vary the value of Vn. And apart that, we can pretty, pretty, it's, it's pretty clear how the steepness of the front is maintained. In all the cases, the displacement that we get, that we got, was exactly the one uh, given by different value of V that we were choosing. And moreover, when we fix V and we vary instead the value of the, uh, of the viscosity nu, here we observe uh, some changes in the curvatures of the, uh, of the solution profile in the, say, in the inner region, while all the solution ended with the vertical tangent. So what was actually controlling this changing in the curvatures was not exactly nu, but was the ratio between nu and V. So when this ratio was greater or equal than one, we, we keep our uh, pretty um, steep profile. While when this ratio become lower than one, we start, we start obtaining this, more, um, this profile with, as, with the more evident curvatures in this uh, more in the region. So we are still uh, looking at this aspect, try to understand if there is actually, um, which, which is actually the reason behind this, this behavior. If there is, for instance, a biological reason be, behind this, um, this, this mechanism. So these were the two preliminary elements. I described you the tumor microtubes region, how we define it, and the kind of diffusion operators and why we choose it. With these elements, we can finally um, see how we, um, which kind of model we formulate. So first of all, the, the equation for the tumor cell, it is a diffusion vection reaction equation where we can see our diffusion term consisting in the flux saturated operators that I just tell you why we, 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 use, we, we, decided, we decided to use it. Um, second, the transport term. We have two transport terms that describe the one, one the, um, the effect of the gradient of the proteases on the uh, tumor population that basically represent a kind of chemotactic force driving the, um, the migration of the cell. And the second term representing how the concentration of um, addition site actually is the driving force or kind of optotactic movement. And both transport terms are described in a limited way, so they saturated for larger gradient. The last term is the reaction term that mainly that basically describe the uh, proliferation of the tumor cell. Here we just use at least initially a simply logistic growth term, uh, but we're going to see then uh, in one of the numerical scenarios how it is actually possible to introduce a more heterogene heterogene heterogeneous kind of proliferation, so modifying this um, this um, this mechanism. Together with tumor, we describe the equation for the proteases, and actually the formulation of their equation is driven by the information we got from the data analysis. So these images are similar to the one I showed you before. This is the first experimental setting where there is a co-staining of GB cell membrane marker and the marker for the MMP distribution, the proteases distribution. We analyze the distribution of this element along this white line that you can see in the four uh, biological images. 
And uh, the first row refers to the case of tumor front region. In fact, we get the accumulation of the marker for the membrane, while the second, um, the, the second row refers to an inner tumor region where there is, the, we, we don't see this accumulation, but only a constant level of marker for the GB cell membrane and lower level. So what was pretty clear was that there was a colocalization of our tumor front region, so the peak in the um, distribution of the red marker, with an overexpression of proteases. In fact, when we then analyzed the inner tumor region, we just got pretty constant and basal level of proteases. So there are still, there are, yes, there are proteases in the inner tumor region, but they are mainly, um, their activity is just mainly connected to the normal uh, activity of the tumor cell. But at the front, there is a pretty clear overexpression of this enzyme. So we take into account this aspect in the uh, model formulation describing the uh, production of proteases uh, localized at the tumor front, um, mediated and weighted with the functional describing the tumor activity and where there is actually ECM that has to be degraded. We couple it with the degradation terms that basically model the fact that uh, once the tumor has moved forward, proteases in the inner tumor are degraded and just the basal level is maintained. And we also include a, a flux saturated mechanism de describing the diffusion, uh, the diffusion term. Uh, because proteases are produced by the cell, but then they are released in the environment through the, through, through the tumor microtubes, and they are free to move, but limited at the area surrounding and limiting their activity at the area surrounding the, uh, the tumor mass. Here I also um, put the equation for DCM because for DCM we simply consider the degradation process that is mediated by the presence of our, um, of our enzyme, the, the, the proteases. Together with tumor DCM and proteases, we model integrins activity. And as I told you, we split the integrins family into these two subfamily, the active and the inactive integrins. Experimentally speaking, we needed two different markers. Uh, for identifying distribution of the active integrins and the inactive integrins. For the active one, we use the focal addition kinesis. Instead, we use a specific protein called the Tallinn protein that uh, basically allows us to, to visualize the distribution of the inactive receptors. This is the second set of experiment. Uh, here you see two sets of images referring both to a tumor front region as we can see from the accumulation of the marker referring to the GB cell membrane. And in both cases, we could, um, we could see how the tumor front region co-localized with a, um, an overexpression of the marker for the uh, FAK, so for the uh, kinases referring to the, um, to the integrins activity. And at the same time, the Tallinn protein was decreasing going from the inner tumor toward the tumor front region. And in particular, this switch between the two population of two kind of integrins was almost um, localized at the beginning of the tumor front region. So there was actually a reverse behavior between the, these two uh, subpopulations. Um, we wanted to be sure about this reverse behavior, so we actually quantify distribution of Tallinn and FAK in inner tumor mass, like the one shown in the first row, and tumor front region, but not um, like here in the direction of cell migration. Instead, we quantify along the tumor front region. So this is why we got the constant level for, the, for all the, uh, the, the marker. But as is pretty clear, you can see that Tallinn is much more expressive in internal region than FAK why this, rever this uh, behavior is reversed at the front, where FAK is much stronger with respect to the Tallinn distribution. So with this information, we uh, define the equation for active and inactive integrins. We model the activation of the integrins, uh, why, why, mm, when there is a binary interaction between inactive integrins and ECM. And we weighted this, uh, this activation with the function of describing the tumor activity. Uh, inactivation is the model, um, assuming that once the tumor has moved forward, in integrins start to be the inactivated. And moreover, we also include an exocytosis, a term describing the exocytosis process. So new integrins, new inactive integrins are produced and located on the membrane up to a certain maximum level. 
We also include in the equation for the integrins two transport term because uh, integrins are subjected, of course, to internal movement of the tumor cell. Because if proteases are produced by the cell and released them in the environment, on the other side, integrins are receptors located on the membrane. So their movement has to be strongly connected to the one of the tumor cell. And since the, um, we are decoupling uh, the tumor from the, uh, from the integrins, we need it to couple again their movement. And therefore we include this transport term with the, with the velocity, with the flow velocity that is given by nonlinear functional of the tumor evolution equation. And in particular, this velocity uh, describes the propagation rate of the tumor. So, here I summarize the, um, the, um, the five equations that represent our macroscopic system. Uh, as I told you, we have a diffusion advection reaction equation for the tumor cell population, a simply reaction diffusion equation for proteases, two transport equations for the integrins, and one simple ODE for the uh, describing ECM degradation. Um, we numerically uh, we discretize the system, we numerically simulate it, and we mainly uh, look a three, um, a, three, in, in a three scenarios. The first one uh, is going to um, represent the simulation of this model, the, the, with, let's call it original model without any modification, while the second and third scenarios will consider some possible modification of our model and how we can actually use this potential to um, get new insight in specific aspects of the process of cell migration. So first, uh, we uh, simulate the original model, looking at the kind of evolutionary pattern it's possible to get, um, uh, the emergence of this uh, evolutionary pattern in the tumor front region, and how the dynamic of dif different elements were, um, were interacting. So we set the initial condition for the, uh, for the numerical simulation, looking at the basal level of MMP, Tallinn, and FAK. And I indicated here with a thick red line the region, the tumor macrotubes region of interest that we are looking at. Uh, just, I want to just point out uh, one thing. Um, in the numerical, numerical simulation, the red line refers to the tumor density. So therefore, we will see high density in the in, higher density in the inner tumor region than at the front. While in the, in the experimental data, the red curve referred to the marker for the GB cell membrane. So that the majority of the tumor macrotubes are concentrated at the front and they are extension of the plasma membrane, the peak that we will see in the experimental uh, data are referring to the tumor front region, just to don't confuse the two, the two uh, lines. So if we let the model evolve over time, we first observe how there is actually the emergence in this tumor front region of this particular evolutionary patterns referring to the, uh, of, to the distribution of proteases and um, active integrins. They are actually uh, capturing the uh, experimental results I showed you before concerning overexpression of MMP and FAK at the tumor front. Moreover, we also got the decrease in the inactive integrins um, distribution and the localization of the split between active and inactive integrins at the beginning of the tumor front region. One um, element we noticed from the numerical experiment was that there was always a little displacement, a little shift, small, but there was always this little shift between the protease distribution and the, and the active integrins distribution. So we were wondering if it was actually, let's say, a numerical artifact, or if the model was telling us something that we didn't look at before in biology. So we went back to our collaborators and we asked them to perform settings in which we could, to perform experimental experiments in which we could observe at the same time on the same brain slides the distribution of both proteases and FAK. And in all the images we analyzed, we always got results similar to the one I'm showing you here. So we always got the co-localization of the tumor front region with the peak, so the, the overexpression of FAK and MMP, but there was always a displacement, a little shift in proteases distribution with respect to the FAK distribution. And this shift was referring to the, to the direction of, uh, of cell migration. And this is an important insight because if you think, for instance, of having just 
a one uh, one time frame, so one to the slice of uh, of uh, of tumors, and we don't know how was um, behaving the tumor before. So we don't know the situation of the tumors before, and we would like to understand which is the direction of migration of the cell, uh, the more likely direction of migration of the cell on that frame. We could, for instance, uh, analyze in different points of the domain the distribution of these two elements and therefore see where the, um, there is this displacement between proteasin and FAK. And this can help us to guess which is actually the direction in which the cells are migrating, even if, even, if we, even if we don't know the situation as told you before or after that, that slice that we, are, that we are looking at. So this was the first um, numerical scenarios. And we start um, try to modify or to introduce modification in the model. And firstly, we look at the effect of the chemotactic force on the tumor profile. And in particular, we look at the possibility of having heterogeneous proliferation in the, um, in the tumor population. So first, uh, if we consider the parameters A1, there is the chemotactic sensitivity. So it is the parameters related to the, to the sensitivity in the transfer term um, that uh, describe cell migration in response to the gradient of the proteases. We uh, started with the, um, the value we estimated for the numerical simulation I showed you before, and we start to increase it of until one order, order of magnitude more. And what we observed was the emergence of heterogeneity in the tumor profile until, for instance, reaching in the case of the dot line to basically two parallel front moving uh, or developing um, one after the other. So we went back to the, numer to the biological images, we saw that actually this possibility was quite realistic. So especially in Drosophila, it's quite common to see two separate fronts that are developing at the same time. And um, somehow the model was telling us, was capturing also this, this aspect. And looking at this kind of images, this situation of um, earlier front or the developing of this different from this heterogeneous front, we were wondering if it was reasonable to think that in this situation, tumor cells could start to proliferate in different way, depending on the region of the domain they were actually located. So we asked our collaborator if it was, first it, it was realistic, and uh, he told us that actually there are no reasons why cells should proliferate in the same way in all the, in, in the entire tumor domain. So we actually proposed two possible mechanisms of heterogeneous proliferation uh, in the case of um, heterogeneous uh, tumor profile. So one possibility is that when we have this heterogeneity, cell in this second region, the second plateau region, start to proliferate more in order to fill the gap, for instance, like fill this gap between the two front. Or a second possibility could be that cell closer to the outer border start to proliferate much more. So we would see a second peak in the density of the tumor cell. And perhaps late in the model evolve, evolve over time, we could even reach the situation of complete split, split of the mass into separate masses. So we propose this to different mechanisms. Would, um, we're trying to understand which of the two is more reasonable or more, it's more probable that tumor cell, depending on the environmental condition or the or different external signals, could use one mechanism on the other for performing this heterogeneous proliferation. Uh, a third scenario that we look at is, um, say, concern the possible effect of tissue porosity changes on the tumor evolution. So we define a parameter set silon um, that describes the tissue porosity. We consider this range of variability for epsilon that we take in from the literature, and we propose an evolutionary law for epsilon that basically describe how porosity changes uh, depending on the protolytic activity of the proteases that are degradating the ECM. Um, considering this evolutionary law, we could think about using our um, model in the, let's say, uh, just in the simple flux saturated form, so just considering the diffusion part without for the moment taking into account the transport time. So just, we want to just to have a look at the um, if direct, direct effect of the tissue porosity changes on this, on this um, devolution of this equation when we assume that the velocity actually depends on the porosity. So it is, um, it is well established that tumor cell or in general cell migration uh, has a velocity that depends on the tissue porosity. There is an optimal value of porosity 
at which we have our maximum value of velocity. But then for too narrow pore, actually Fell are not always able to squeeze enough to move inside the matrix, and therefore velocity will decrease. But also for too large pore, actually cells are not able to attach anymore to the matrix and therefore move in, in, in inside the, the tissue. So again, uh, the velocity will decrease. Um, actually, uh, this is also one of the reasons why it is important to limit the proteolytic activity so to define a limited term in the, pro in the proteasis uh, evolution, because otherwise we will get proteases diffusing everywhere in the domain and just degrading the ECM. And the, the, the porosity of the tissue will become so large that the cell velocity will decrease and tumor cell may migrate quite efficiently. So they actually found this balance between degradation and optimal value of velocity. So uh, going, sorry, going back to the, to the numerical results, we consider this evolutionary for, for the velocity and we compare what, uh, what is the evolution of our flux, of our diffusion um, equation in the flux saturated form for constant, for constant velocity and for a, for a value of the velocity that depends on the porosity. What we can observe is that when the velocity is not constant, we get the, the emergence of heterogeneity because cell, depending on where they are located, feel different value of the tissue porosity, depending also on the activity of the proteases, and therefore heterogeneity could arise. And even if here a unique front is recovered, because eventually cell can um, uh, are able to feel the same um, level of porosity, here we, what we got is a faster progression of the tumor. So actually, the tissue porosity are having an effect not just on the profile, but also in the velocity of the progression, of the, on the speed of the tumor progression. And thus, it is important, since it is a really realistic aspect, that something that actually happening in the, in the biology is really important to take it into account in the model. And using a flux saturated operators allows to control directly and quite easily these changes in the, in the velocity of the cell. So just to wrap up what we, uh, what we did, I present you an integrated framework uh, that we used for study the dynamics and evolution of the tumor from in relation with the dynamics of specific aspect connected to proteases and integrins. On one side, we have our experimental part. Um, there is one or two big block of the study that, uh, that allow us to understand how tumor activity was heterogeneous in the domain in relation to proteases and integrins distribution. And on the other, we have the mathematical framework that is based, as I told you, on this flux saturated mechanism that allow us to well define the invasion front and control um, the, the, the tumor velocity. The numerical, the numerical simulation first uh, um, basically are telling us that the model is in a good agreement with, agreement with experimental data. And moreover, um, I show you in the second and third scenarios how the model can be used to actually study further mechanisms involved in gene progression and how it can be used to make prediction in um, and getting new insight in this specific uh, in, in some specific mechanism concerning cell migration. But more important, uh, not more important, but um, uh, more important in conclusion, we have the perspective. So the study actually, I think that represents a good platform for the study of tumor macrotubes dynamics in the context of glioblastoma progression and several extensions are possible. We are mainly look at the moment a two um, perspective. We are trying, we are, um, we are working on a 2D extension of the model because firstly, for sure in 2D, the uh, study on tissue porosity and the serogenous proliferation will be, will be much more, will be more interesting and will help us to get deeper insight in the process of cell migration. And moreover, the 2D scenarios will allow us to include in the model the effect of brain fiber directionality on the, on the development of, this, um, of the tumor microtubes. So just super preliminary simulation. Uh, here, super preliminary results. We have our 2D domain. The uh, high row indicated the fiber direction. Here is the initial location of the tumor. This, uh, this is just five hour of simulation. We are still working on it, but we can see how the tumor microtubes region is developing in response to the direction that we have here of the fibers, how proteases and active integrins located in this, in this specific region. And again, which seems to, um, to keep the displacement of proteases with respect to active integrins that we got in the 1D case. 
as I told you, we are still working on it because um, especially um, concerning the numerical implementation, there are some challenges that we are trying to, 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 to address. But second perspective is the um, include the, is to include or uh, in the modeling um, the analysis of two intracellular pathway and their effect on the process of tumor migration. In particular, we are looking at the wing and H2 pathway. Um, it, is, it, it is well established that um, the wing signaling is uh, strongly um, connected with the process of glioblastoma progression. In particular, uh, glioma cells steal a wing from the neurons causing neurodegeneration, and this wing um, is um, involving in the process of tu tumor microtubes overexpression and consequent overexpression of proteases. Uh, we are trying to understand the role of wing in the dynamics of specific addition molecules, and moreover, if it is possible to include in this cycle first the effect of uh, or the role of integrins and specifically the SAK, so the, the, uh, the kinase is referring to the integrins activity, and also to include in the, in the, in the, in the cycle the effect of the HO pathway on both cell migration and cell proliferation. So this is what I wanted to tell you about this model, and I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Martina. This is very interesting uh, work of yours uh, in the dynamics of glioblastomas. Uh, now we have some time for questions. I wonder if there's somebody in the audience who would like to uh, open his microphone, her microphone, or just write down something in the chat. And we will uh, read it out for you. Well, if not, uh, I, I would like to ask you some uh, particular question about the 2D simulations you briefly mm -hmm. showed us. Uh, are you using the finite differences or finite elements? It is fine. I mean, in 1D, uh, finite difference and finite elements are equivalent. It is, it is finite elements, and the 2D scenarios is implemented right now with finite elements. So the, we are trying to, to, to use it in, with finite element also because it would be uh, then easier to handle, for instance, more realistic um, domain with finite mm -hmm. elements than with finite difference. And you say that you are facing a lot of challenges. Yeah, um, yeah. it is. I mean, the, the simulations are quite expensive, so we're trying to find a more uh, efficient way to implement the especially the flux saturated terms because they need a really fine spatial and, tem and, and tem temporal mesh. And since the domain is, of course, is bigger, we are, we are trying to uh, find a more efficient way to do it. For instance, there are some methods of adaptive mesh in which we could uh, mm -hmm. consider a finer mesh uh, around the tumor front and, and less fine and, and much big mesh at, in the rest of the domain where we don't care at the moment. For the for the dynamics, but it's, it's a bit challenging to to implement it. Uh, I, would be, I would be curious to see it indeed for the for the very singular behavior that this yeah. uh, nonlinear operators that you are using are yeah. entailing. Okay, we have a lot of uh, issues <laughs> to fix, I guess. Uh, okay, if uh, there are no questions so far, I would also. I'm also curious about another technical detail, uh, which is related to the one, the description you're using. Uh, so here you, you have several options. Uh, you start from the linear diffusion mechanism. Now you have also porous media. You have these flux saturated uh, operators and you chose to combine both. We, I mean, I, I was showing the, the three uh, three operators among the possible one that we can use and why we actually choose the last one. So I tried to give the reasons why we decided to discard, for, discard the linear one because we couldn't get um, the, um, the well definition of the front. And of course we didn't want an infinite speed of propagation and why instead of choosing a classical nonlinear operators, we wanted to, we, we choose the flux saturated one. So, because we want that control on the velocity, it is important, as, as you see, especially in the numerical part, in the third scenarios with, with, other, with another kind of operators, we, we, we didn't wanna, we wouldn't be able to, um, to, to tune, to, um, to control the, the velocity with the changes in the process. It would be 
different, it will be the different control. So this is why we choose the, the last one. We didn't do actually a, a comparison of the model with the linear diffusion, the nonlinear one and the flux saturated, but they redirectly went for the, um, for the, third, for the third option for, for, these, for these reasons. Precisely, that was one of the things I, I did not completely understand because it is, it is the third option or it is the third option combined with the second option? No, no, it's the third one. It's just the, the third so one. The, the small m or little m? So the, yeah, the simulation were done for m equal to one. Oh, okay, that, that, that was yeah. my point because yeah, when yeah, yeah. not no, equal to one, uh, you lose, uh, I guess you lose control of the speed uh, in trade yeah, of yeah. nothing yeah. else, I guess, that, that yeah, if, yeah. if you change the m, it is because you are seeking a different effect. Yes. That was my question. Sorry. Okay, so far it's only equal to one, right? Yes. In that okay. situation, okay. it was always what one. Sorry. Uh, and that leads me to another question as mm -hmm. well. You mentioned at some point uh, some parameter epsilon, which you tell us uh, that you interpret as being some tissue porosity that's going to yes. modulate the speed. Uh, would it make sense? Uh, to relate it to the exponent in the Purus Media equation. Yes, there, there is part. also that option. Um, to the exponent or to the coefficient uh, in front. In the, the sort of diffusion like coefficient. Uh, exactly. Right? In that coefficient, okay. there is also involved the porosity. Uh, so one can think about modifying it there, but uh, there is not that direct, there is not that direct connection with the velocity because there are all, all, also other parameters involved in the, let's say, diffusion coefficient, let's call it this way, the kind of diffusion coefficient um, in front. There is also um, uh, parameters related to the viscosity or to the pressure. So it would be, there wouldn't be that direct control. So mm. for changes in the velocity, changes in the velocity. The exponent, I think, is more related to, um, I don't think it's, yes, it's related to the porosity, but not in that direct way. Mm. OK. So it will be more like a tuning parameter yes. thing after, yes. after you acquire the data. I see. OK. In fact, if you, if you, if you do that uh, uh, directly of the coefficient m, uh, what happens is that uh, if you have some instability in the, in the front, Due that, that the velocity uh, diminish uh, diminishing a, a little in the, the evolution of the front, these mm -hmm. uh, singularities increase in time, and probably the, the the system are not able to 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 adapt these singularities to the to absorb it broke or something like that. Mm -hmm. In this way, it seems more well, seems more natural. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, thank you, Martina. I wonder if there are some uh, additional questions. Yes, maybe I have another one for Martina. So, as far as I understand, most of your modeling is at, I mean, all, all of your modeling is at the macroscopic scale, right? Yes. So, in a sense, I agree that uh, these sort of um, uh, flash saturated uh, operators and also um, saturated transport, as you propose, is feasible in the sense that it agrees with uh, some uh, experimental evidence, but do you have some, some idea about uh, uh, a more fine uh, modeling at the microscopic scale, like cell-cell dynamics? Um, we didn't look at cell-cell dynamics. We started to uh, think about the possible kinetic version. Uh, at some point, we started thinking about the kinetic version of the models and how to derive uh, let's say, just think about the flux saturated uh, terms without all, all the other addition part, how to derive it from a lower level of description. Uh, there are some work uh, in that direction already. Um, it is not still uh, well defined how to derive this from the kinetic formulation, that term, but we, we were thinking about it at some point, but it's still an ongoing idea. And mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how, which is the better way to, to do it. With, if there is already one method that can, um, that can help us, or there are, there are some concerning for instance, the, the mean field or, um, or some particle methods, some, some, some methods related to the filament in the fluids, uh, but uh, we, we didn't try yet with, the, with this model. I mean, it would be really interesting to, to do also a kinetic formulation, yes. To, I mean, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm. 
Alright, so it seems there are no, no queries in the chat. So if, uh, if you like, we, we can close it here. I wonder one last uh, opportunity to ask something to Martina. And uh, well, if not, uh, thank you again, Martina. Thank you. Very thank you very much. Seminar. Thank you, everybody, for being here as well. And let me just uh, tell you that we will have the last seminar of the season next week by Lorenzo Pareschi, who will uh, switch again to epidemics. And uh, more particularly, he will speak about the special spread of epidemics under uncertain data. And we will announce it uh, at the beginning of the next week. Thank you again, everybody. And uh, hope, let's hope for the best. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Let me stop the recording.